Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Growing up in Northeast Ohio as a teenager, we had pretty much two things to do. One was play football. I played for the Chardon Hill Toppers. Go, go, go Toppers, Topper Power, right? They're in the playoffs right now. So, you know, not that I follow that. They just happen to be going to the regional championship next week. Anyways, so that, uh, playing football. But the other thing that we had to do, small town, Northeast Ohio, was to work on our trucks. And uh, part of working on our trucks included putting in a sweet sound system. Right? Okay. So all the kids were getting these stereo systems for their trucks, right? And uh, does this make sense? Like loud systems in a pickup truck? I don't know. In Northeast Ohio, it made perfectly good sense, okay? And so... Everyone was getting these systems, and while all my friends were getting these sound systems in their trucks, I was saving my money. Working summer jobs, saving my money, so I couldn't just buy any system. I could buy the biggest system, and it was my senior year that I finally raised enough money, saved up enough money to buy a sound system for my 1988 F-150, it was, I had three JL Audio 10-inch uh, um, uh, W6 with a PPI amplifier, and I had uh, in the doors, I had these MB quartz, uh, five and a quarter, you know, it, it was awesome, right? So the first day I got it, right after I got it, I was rolling up to a party and was by myself in my truck. My friends were outside. The sound system was off. I rolled down the windows and hit on. Boom! You know, right? As my truck is shaking, as the neighbor's rattle, windows are rattling, right? It was awesome. Or so I thought. Um, apparently, not everyone universally agrees that large, loud sound systems are as awesome as I did when I was 18. Uh, there were numerous times when I would be blasting my system at a red light, and the car next to me would uh, give me the one-finger salute. <clears throat> and just to clarify, it wasn't a thumbs up. Um, there were times when I was going over to friends' houses, had my system up loud, and their parents had to call the neighbors and apologize <laughs> because my stereo was too loud. And uh, I had numerous friends say, Larry, what? why did you do that? And my simple thought was, because I'm awesome. Right? <laughs> like, this is awesome, right? And I kept this sound system for many years, kept it through college and even into seminary. And so here I am at the seminary, rolling around the seminary campus in my truck, system, you know, bump bumping, professors kind of scratching their head, you know, other guys saying, y you know, you're going to be a, a, a pastor here in a, in a few months, right? And yet I couldn't hear. Yeah, and yet this, my, the, the stereo system was so loud and my hearing was so deaf that I couldn't hear when people were saying to me, maybe you should turn it down a little bit, right? Maybe it's a little too loud. But God, he was continuing graciously to talk to me. And he said, okay, Larry, so if you're not going to turn it down, let me help you out. And uh, one evening, while he's at the seminary, uh, someone came by, popped the trunk on my car at that point. I no longer had a truck. I had a car, but the sound system came with it. You know, it moved over. <laughs> uh, they popped the trunk, and they took out my three JL audio 10-inch W6 subwoofers. 
It was a hard day. But God did what he needed to do to me so that I could hear what he was saying. Sometimes our situation in life, our views on the world, they, they deafen us to the word of God. Even if we're Christ followers, right? And yet, God in his mercy gives ears to hear to his people. In um, Caesarea, Peter had just gotten there. He's preaching a sermon. And in the middle of his sermon, the people that were there in that home, the friends and family of Cornelius, these Gentiles, what do they start doing? They start exclaiming and proclaiming and glorifying Jesus. They're busting out in full-blown Pentecost style, speaking in tongues, filled with the Holy Spirit, praise of God in the middle of uh, of Peter's sermon. It must have been a sight to behold because these people heard the word of God and responded. They heard the word of God and their lives had been changed. But it took a little bit of work. God had to work on people to get them to hear the good news. So let's talk about that a little bit. The, the way that God had to work on, the, on different people in order to get his good news across. First, we meet an individual by the name of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was a soldier in the Roman army, right? He was a centurion, meaning that he was the, he was a commander of a, a hundred soldiers, right? So what is that? Is that uh, like a company equivalent, give or take, uh, in the army? Something like that, platoon company, right? And he's overseeing uh, this... Um, as a centurion, he's overseeing these soldiers in the Roman army. They, he, they lived, or they were stationed in Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is not something you're going to run across, the, uh, a town that you're going to run across in the Old Testament. Because the Caesarea didn't exist until the Romans created it. Caesarea is actually quite a, a marvel, a testament to Roman technology. There wasn't a harbor at Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea. And so what did Romans do? They built a harbor, a man-made harbor. They invented concrete that could be set under water in order to build this harbor so that they can use this city as a port because Romans couldn't use Jewish cities to bring in their goods because they were... were, uh, impure. And so they had to create their own city. Caesarea also had a hippodrome. That's a track for horse racing. <laughs> they had an amphitheater for those, the, uh, you know, terrible, um, the, the, uh, the plays that the Jews would not be comfortable with, right? This was uh, a pagan city. This was like the Vegas of their community. And Jews, (laughs) they didn't have anything to do with this town, Caesarea. So Cornelius is stationed there with his soldiers. But Cornelius was a good guy. He, somewhere, had found out about God, probably being stationed in Israel. He's going to hear the word of the Lord at some point. And so, on the one hand, he was completely... Gentile, meaning he wasn't Jewish, he didn't obey Jewish dietary laws, he wasn't circumcised, he he wasn't from Jewish lineage, he was of the Italian cohort, we're told. And yet, something about God's word resonated with him. So that he prayed, 
<laughs> just so happens. What time were we told in our text that he was praying? At 3 o'clock happens to be the Jewish time of prayer, one of the Jewish times of prayer, right? 3 o'clock he's praying. And he gives alms. He gives to the poor. He cares for people. God, you can see, is working on his heart. But there's still a disconnect. There's still, he still doesn't know Jesus. He still needs to hear the good news. He needs these ears that only the Lord can give. And so, what happens? Well, first thing God does to break the silence, if you will, so that his word could cut through, first thing he does is he gives a vision to Cornelius as he's praying. An angel comes, dressed in white, says, hey, God hears your prayers. God sees your good works. He hears you. He sees you. He loves you. What you need to do, get that, this guy named Peter down the coast in Joppa, have him come up to you so he can tell you all about Jesus. So there's Cornelius. Now, Peter, at the same time, was going through similar things. Peter was praying, right? And we know Peter. We've heard about Peter a lot through this Acts series. Peter, he's the lead disciple, the lead apostle. He's the, the preacher on Pentecost that when he preached, after he was done, 3,000 people came to the faith. He's a Jew. He's been a Jew his entire life. He also knows this. Those Gentiles are dirty. And we don't need anything to do with them. They're unclean. They need to stay away. And this has been ingrained in Peter deep to his core. So that even after following Jesus for three years, even after seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead and, and eating food with him and drinking drink with him, even after seeing Jesus ascended and being commissioned and sent out, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's where we are now. Even through all that, he still was hard of hearing because of his preconceived notions as a Jew. And yet God gives him a vision. Shows him a tablecloth of foods, of animals. Animals that Jews were not supposed to eat. That, was, that were not kosher. That were against their dietary laws. And Jesus tells them specifically, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And what does Peter, the good Jewish boy, do? By no means, Lord. I've never eaten any of that stuff. I wouldn't do that. No way. And so what, does, what happens? God tells him again. And shows him the vision again. And God tells him one more time. Times we're told that Peter had to be told in this vision that God chose no partiality. Do not consider things that are unclean that God has made clean. And so Peter, after this vision, is left kind of wondering, what, what does this mean? And knock, knock, knock. Soldiers from Cornelius up the coast come to, to see Peter, and they say, hey, we need to talk to you. Our boss, Cornelius, he sent us. So they went to sleep that night, and then they go up the coast the next morning. Peter goes into Caesarea, that city, that, that dirty city. He goes there, and he tells what he's seen. He tells Cornelius, hey, God's working on me. I don't know exactly what this means, but I, when those guys came knocking, I knew I had to go. So here I am. Cornelius tells him about the vision, tells Peter about the vision he had. So Peter he starts preaching. Peter starts preaching about Jesus. He starts preaching about the way that Jesus was baptized by, by John and received power from God, the way that, that Jesus 
healed those who are oppressed by spirits, by demons. How Jesus died by being hung on a tree. And how Jesus overcame death. And that everyone now who, who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins from God. Period. Neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. The forgiveness of God is for all. God wouldn't let anyone miss this good news. And so he continued to work on people so that they could hear, so that they could believe, so that now Peter could say to Cornelius and Cornelius' family and friends and fellow soldiers, you're my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm going to be with you for eternity. Thanks be to God. Truly God has shown no partiality. And he's given us ears to hear. So now is where I want a little participation. Where have your ears been stopped up? I know it's a tough one. It's a vulnerable, vulnerable one. So the no noise of daily life, negativity, naysaying, sadness that's around, kind of numbs us to even want to care. Maybe is am I on the right track there? Yeah. Yeah. Why bother? Right. Where have your ears been stopped up in such a way that you haven't been able to hear the word of God? Anywhere? A any other thoughts? Yeah, Brandon, go ahead. Just society, just society, how it's like this world is what you have. Make, uh, make that the best you can here. Enjoy, enjoy your time here because this is what you've got. Right. And that's not. Hope is Society's message of eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die, and we just kind of get caught up in that and lose sight of the eternal promises of, of Jesus, right? Am I? Yeah, that, and then also like finding our joy here. Oh, uh, yeah. Finding our joy here. Yeah, so the kingdom of God, we pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Come here and today and come ultimately on that last day, right? But uh, yeah, it's both and. Yeah, good, good, good. So, who else? Anyone else? Where do you have a hard time maybe hearing the word of God in your life? Scott? Politics. Politics. <laughs> and, and during election time, it brings up all the diversity and differences and that's not very good about bringing people together. Yeah. So that's Lord have mercy. Uh, and that's it. That's where I'm going. Uh, so thanks for leading in so I didn't have to be the one to break that ice. So, <laughs> um, it's loud, isn't it? Politics are loud. All you have to do is turn on the news, get onto Facebook, and it's people screaming, vote for this person. This person's evil. This, is, this uh, philosophy is, is wicked. This is from the devil. If you're a true Christian, you will do this, right? All, all these sorts of things that are being not just yelled, but screamed. And, and where for me, where my, my hearing gets messed up is, is, is the way that my ears are connected to my heart. Because in the middle of that, if people are yelling, then my heart gets all ugly and nasty. And then I start, I, I, I'm no longer to, able to view people as, as the people that God loves. As people for whom Jesus came and died. And, and I start to view them negatively and, and evilly. And whew, it's loud and it's exhausting. 
And uh, so I just wanted to share some of my thoughts on what it means to hear as a Christian in, a, in such a loud time. What it means to hear the, the Word of God in the midst of political ranting in our world. Let me s say this to start. As your pastor, I care less about how you vote and more about how you act before, during, and after the election. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't care how you vote. I do. Voting matters because people's lives are impacted by the people who are elected into office, by the policies that are adopted. It matters. But it is also for that very reason that we need to, in the midst of this turmoil, be listening to the Word of God and be loving our neighbors, even the ones who are different than us. Sometimes, sometimes this, sometimes Christians treat politics like the Vegas of life. What happens in politics stays in politics. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's not true. <laughs> Jesus sees how we act, no matter what our political mode, or what our uh, whether it's right or wrong in His eyes, what we what what we want or who we're voting for. He sees not just who we vote for or how we vote, but He sees how we act. I'll also say this. I care less about how you vote and more about how you act before, during, and after voting because of this. Jesus isn't on the ballot. Jesus is not on the ballot. The last time that Jesus was on the ballot... We voted for Barabbas. And Jesus still became king. Not because he needed our vote or our say-so or our approval. Jesus still became king because he went through faithfully as God's son, went through persecution, went through execution, went through death, and overcame those things by the power of the Spirit overcame even our vote against him so that we could hear the good news of God. Overcame through his resurrection when he was eating and drinking with Peter and the other apostles. Overcame and then was ascended into heaven because of his faithfulness to God in heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, where all power, both in heaven and on earth, are his. Period. That won't change on Wednesday after our election. Jesus is king now. Jesus will be king on Wednesday. Jesus will be king for eternity. Thanks be to God. And so, here, here's my, my challenge to you. Here's what I do. When, when I'm in a, a situation where whew, uh, I, I have strong feelings about a particular issue or something in my life, and I can't control the outcome, I, I do this thing, and I don't, you know, push back on this. Maybe it's not completely right, but I, I wager with God in a sense. Or what I do is this. I say, God... Whether this thing turns out the way I want it to, or whether this thing turns out differently than I want it to, I will sing a doxology to your name. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. On Tuesday, or many of you, I'm sure, have already filled out your ballots. But, and I'm, I'm, if I've got my finger on the pulse of this congregation, my guess is this, that we're going to be voting differently. And that's okay, because we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. On Wednesday or Thursday or next year, whenever we figure out the election results, right? Um, I, I invite you to, to sing a doxology. Sing it out loud. Sing it boldly. <laughs> because God will still reign. And let me add one more thing. Not just sing a doxology, but love your neighbor. Maybe especially the neighbor who lives across from you that has the political sign of the opponent for who you're voting for. Right? Maybe especially that person. Even if it feels like you're crossing over to Caesarea and it's dirty. It's, all right, God's made all things clean. I'm going. I'm following you, Jesus. And I'm going to share the word, the gospel that has changed my life and that is changing the world. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen.